Thank you very much for that introduction. So the one thing that I want to talk about today is for, to help you decide if you're a pre and a mean or if you're a control correspondence because it's very different um, timelines and different information that you'll get. So we encourage early engagement with the agency for complex products. We want to make sure that you get a first cycle review. That's our goal. That's your goal. Uh, first cycle uh, approval. And uh, the main ways that we have for early engagement with the agency is control correspondence and the meetings that have been talked about. I just show this slide because I just want to point out that the first part, the blue part, is the area that we're talking about today. This is before you submit your ANDA, where we have the pre-submission meetings, the product development meetings, and control correspondence. Once you have your ANDA in-house, those things kind of go away. Uh, I think it's important to mention the different meanings of complex. Complex products are not the same as complex controls. Complex products, which uh, have, has been talked about previously, but they generally include products with complex active ingredients, such as peptides, something like that. Controlled drug device, or sorry, complex drug device combinations, um, inhalation products tend to be like that. Uh, and other products where early engagement could be beneficial. So complex controls must meet specific criteria regardless of whether the drug product is complex or not. So essentially you can have a complex control with a non-complex product. For standard control correspondence as mentioned is you have 60 days. Generally we're talking one to two questions requesting information on a specific element of your generic drug product development and certain for certain post-approval submission requirements. And you can find that in the control correspondence draft guidance. Uh, and you are permitted to ask for clarification if you feel that your response is ambiguous and that's a 14-day turnaround time. We ask that you uh, submit that request within seven calendar days of you getting your response and then we'll have 14 days to get you a response back. For complex course, control correspondence. These are answered within 120 days. So it's actually a fair, fairly narrow uh, definition of what makes a complex control correspondence. The control needs to, could um, involve clinical content. Uh, the uh, other uh, one is bioequivalence protocols for, for reference listed drugs with REMS or TASU. And the third criteria would be if you were looking for an evaluation of alternative bioequivalence approach, within the same study type. Those are the three things that would qualify you for a 120-day control instead of a 60-day control. Clarification of ambiguities are also allowed on these controls. So product development means, as we mentioned, they're a scientific exchange. They're meant to be really easily early in your development program um, when you're, you're trying to uh, work out your um, the issues of your development program. So you have uh, you maybe have a novel proposed study design you want to discuss with us, or maybe you have an alternative bioequivalence approach, or something like that that you want to get our opinion on before you spend the time doing it or the money doing it. And we will provide targeted advice regarding your specific ongoing ANDA development program. So we'll be very targeted to you, so what you submit is what we are going to be responding to. So there's meetings that we will grant, and in this case, meetings, um, if we have a, if we do not have a product-specific guidance known as a PSG, um, and you have a complex product, we will, issue, we will grant your meeting. If we do have a product-specific guidance, but you are proposing alternative equivalence evaluation, then that, for a complex product, will also grant that meeting. Then there's a section of meetings that we may grant, depending on resources available. And these are ones where um, the, the meeting concerns complex product development issues other than those identified in the previous slides. So for example, you've developed, a, we have a product-specific guidance. The prospective AD applicant is not proposing an alternative equivalence evaluation, but the request raises other complex issues that are better suited to a meeting format. So the, for the pre-submission meetings, which are usually uh, submitted within six to 12 months, because the 
the um, meeting timeline is five to six months altogether. Uh, you are ready or close to submitting your application. You can discuss the format and content. This is your opportunity to tell us if you have anything new or novel in your um, ANDA that you're going to be submitting. Uh, applicants, um, you know, hopefully can obtain advice that will enable efficient review and improve the chance of first cycle approvals. And they, but again, we will not include substantial review of summary data or full, full study reports. So this is for all meetings, and this is, uh, again, Catherine talked about this, but it's very important. The prospective applicant should submit a complete meeting package, which could include any data that you've done, any studies that you've done uh, backing up your, um, your proposals. And uh, the other thing is control correspondences would not adequately address the first, your question and that the product development meeting would significantly improve and assessment of efficiency. So we will grant, we, we may grant some meetings in those cases. So again, our, am I a product pre-submission or product development meeting? It really depends on where you are in your development program. Early on in your development program, you're a product development meeting. You need um, advice before you're going to start a study. Uh, you have done a study and you've got uh, interesting results and you need to discuss those with us. Um, Pre-submission meetings are for six to 12 months before your submission. You should typically have your stability set. batch has already started at that point. And uh, it's to discuss the format and content of your ANDA. Um, so the other thing is in my control correspondence for product development. So this is where timing is really important. So for controls, you have 60 days. And it's for rapid input into your development program, for guidance clarification, et cetera. Uh, and complex controls are 120 days. We've already gone over the, the requirements for those. And so then we also have, um, am I thinking of submitting an optional meeting request or a control? And this, again, timing is everything. Meetings are best for multi multidisciplinary questions. Controls are, but controls are for single questions or small group or closely related questions. And again, you really consider your timelines. Do I want to get an answer in 60 days or do I want to get an answer in five to six months? Is this yours? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I am done. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Bhagwan. <laughs> All right, so as mentioned by the previous speakers, there are mainly two pathways to engage with the agency during your ANDA development program, uh, pre-ANDA meetings and uh, control correspondence. Uh, pre-ANDA meetings are typically granted for complex products uh, as defined in the refer to commitment letter. There are a few categories that uh, you can go through, like complex dosage forms, complex routes of administration or complex formulations, etc. But they could also be granted for other products that are outside of this definition uh, where complexity or uncert uncertainty concerning the approval pathway or possible alternative approach for equivalence would benefit from early scientific engagement. Uh, but this determination is made by the agency and not by the sponsors. Uh, and usually pre and r meetings are granted when there are multiple questions. Uh, control correspondence. Uh, sponsors can engage with the agency via com control correspondence route for basically any type of product. It doesn't have to be a complex product. Uh, and it's m mainly suitable when you have a single question or closely related questions. So when a pre and &E meeting request comes in, uh, both OGD and OPQ, they do a triage of these meeting requests. And I'm going to talk about the OPQ process here. Uh, the factors that go into determining whether we are going to grant uh, these pre and &E meetings are, is it a complex product as defined in the commitment letter? Uh, is the meeting package complete? And as you heard from Chris and Catherine, uh, most common cause of denial is the incomplete meeting package. Uh, does meeting package includes issues that are typically assessed by Office of Pharmaceutical Quality? Are there guidances that are available uh, that cover the issues that are included in the meeting package? 
And finally, does the meeting package contains questions in this uh, pre-NDA meeting will enhance the assessment efficiency? So these are all the factors that we uh, go through before making a decision whether to grant this meeting or not. Uh, I'm just going to present a metrics on denied pre-NDA meetings. Uh, and the time period is between October 1st, 2017 to uh, end of the year 2018. 31% uh, of the denials were basically the products were not complex as defined in the commitment letter. And we basically recommended the applicant go through control correspondence route. 15% of the products were complex, but we still recommended that the applicants go through CC route because the, there was a single question or the Questions were easily answered by control correspondence. And then there were 54% of the uh, meetings were denied because although the products were complex, again, the meeting packages were incomplete. And in some cases, uh, sponsors were submitting pre and &E meetings for actual ANDAs that, that were in CR status. So that, is, that was also not acceptable. Uh, so let's talk about both non-complex and complex products. How uh, sponsors can engage with the agency. For non-complex products, most common non-complex products are oral immediate release tablets and capsules, oral modified release tablets and capsules, and injections, solution, uh, typically solutions, and there are many others. In most of these cases, if you are going to submit pa and DA meetings, the request is likely to be denied. I will not say they are definitely going to be denied because as, as I mentioned before, if there are any issues or uncertainties that would benefit from early engagement with agency, we, would, we may grant it, but in most cases, they are likely to be denied. And we typically recommend controlled correspondences for uh, these types of products. Uh, typical OPQ-related controlled correspondences for non-complex products, they, the most, most of the, uh, these I've seen are size and shape of oral dosage form. This, by far, in my experience, has been the most common uh, reason why folks submit uh, controlled correspondence. Uh, stability protocols and data requirements. Exhibit batch size, scales, and sites uh, where it's manufactured and the packaging requirements. Uh, in case of injections, uh, in-use and dilution studies. Uh, many sponsors wish to incorporate two API sources, so they have questions about those. Uh, excipient choice and levels. Uh, in most of the cases, we strongly recommended that uh, sponsors follow FDA guidances, ICH guidelines, uh, RLE label information, and applicable compendial standards. Uh, most of these resources cover the issues that I mentioned above. Uh, I'm going to present an example of a controlled correspondence that, as, as I mentioned, it's most commonly, in my experience, uh, size of oral modified release tablets or capsules is larger than the recommendations in FDA guidance for size, shape, and other physical attributes for, uh, for generic tablets and capsules. Uh, this is the by far most common uh, CC that I've seen. Uh, and common justifications that I see for this type of control correspondence is, well, there are approved generic products of similar size. My tablet is only slightly larger than RLD. Uh, we are using a different formulation technology compared to RLD. For example, RLD is using osmotic mechanism. I'm using, formulating a matrix, matrix tablet. Now, these justifications are not adequate by themselves. These can be supportive statements in your justification, but, but these are really not the primary justifications. Uh, uh, you have to remember these guidances have been very thoughtfully developed and a lot of uh, research has gone into it. So you have to justify any deviation based on target population, indication, patient compliance, dosing recommendation, including the length of treatment, medication errors. So you really have to follow a patient-centric approach when you want to justify deviating from guidances. I'm going to present three case studies. I'm going to go through them very quickly about these are the product uh, development meeting requests and how we decided whether we are going to grant them or not. So case study one is a PDF methane request for an ophthalmic emulsion. So again, we go through OPQ triage. Uh, complete meeting package was provided in this case. 
is this a complex product as per the Gadufa definition? And yes, it is complex product because it is complex route of delivery. It's also a complex formulation because it's emulsion. Uh, did the meeting package involve issues assessed by OPQ? And we said uh, it, there were issues such as drug distribution between different phases, stability testing plan, clarification of characterization tests versus routine release tests. And uh, we did not feel that in this case there was any single question which uh, uh, in which a feed dermating would significantly enhance uh, assessment efficiency. Uh, because all OPQ related questions were very straightforward and we felt that they could be answered using controlled correspondence and actually the sponsor would get a faster response time than uh, a pre-NDA meeting. So OPQ decision was to decline pre-development uh, pre meeting request. But remember, this is just one part of it. OGD also makes their own determination of whether these meetings should be granted or not. And OGD's decision was also to decline pre-development meeting request, primarily because a PSG was available for this complex product, and the firm was not proposing an alternative equivalence approach. A firm was only requesting clarification about the PSG. Uh, and we again OGD thought was could be an answered through a controlled correspondence. So basically the decision was to deny the meeting request and the firm was advised to submit a controlled correspondence and it was to their advantage uh, because they could get faster response. Uh, case study two was a PDA meeting request for a vaginal ring product. Again going through, tala, through the tri triage, complete meetings package was provided. This is a complex product because it's complex dosage form and complex drug device combination. The meeting package involved issues assessed by OPQ. There were multiple multidisciplinary questions such as microbiology, drug product facility, uh, CGMP inspections, uh, scale up, there was a scale up proposal. There were device related issues such as biocompatibility, extractable leachables and specifications. And there were questions about controls on excipients. Uh, also, drug release days for this long-acting product. So we basically decided that because this is a complex drug device product with limited experience and there were questions for multiple OPQ sub offices, uh, we decided to grant this meeting. Uh, and also, there was no product-specific guidance or CMC guidance that covered the concerns uh, in the meeting package. Uh, case study three, this was a a product development meeting for nasal spray. And there was a single question that the firm asked, can we use purified water and a preservative, but RLD uses uh, water for injection and aseptic processing? Now, it's typically, a single question like this would just, we, just, we would just say, file a controlled correspondence instead of product development meeting request. But as you know, most nasal products, there is a reason why there is a recommendation about Q1, Q2 in nasal, nasal product specific guidances. And the firm was sort of deviating from that. And, and they, there was no background information in the product. So the meeting package was incomplete. There was no product development plan provided, no formulation information provided, no B strategy provided since they are changing the formulation from RLD, and no device information provided because if you're changing the formulation and if device is unknown, we didn't know how it would perform. So instead of recommending them uh, that go and file a control, we decided a meeting request should be denied and we asked them to resubmit with complete meeting package. So those are our thoughts behind the decisions that we make during grant or deny of these meeting, uh, meeting packages. So in conclusion, uh, I would state that pre and &E meetings and control correspondences are useful pathways for prospective applicants to get targeted feedback on product development uh, plan during their and and, and their and the submission. Uh, prospective applicants should select the appropriate pathway to get feedback from FDA, depending on the complexity of product, development stage, and the number of questions. They should submit a complete meeting package, including a data package, and also ask specific proposals and questions rather than broad questions. Uh, before you submit a package, please read all applicable guidances and standards and justify the proposed deviations from applicable guidances and standards using the scientific and patient-centric. 